Hi, my name is Joseph Craig, and I'm the editor of the Scientific American Book Club. And I'm here speaking with Eugenie Scott, the Executive Director of the National Center for Science Education. So, Dr. Scott, could you tell us how you became interested in evolution? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, um, that's kind of a fun story. Uh, when I was in junior high, my sister brought home um, a freshman anthropology book that had in it um, reconstructions of the early fossils, you know, like Peking Man and Neanderthal Man and all that. And I just was hooked. I thought this was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. On the other hand, um, since I graduated high school in 1963, there was no evolution in my high school textbook. I had to wait until I got to the university before I could actually study evolution. But I did and uh, remained fascinated by it ever since. Not just human evolution, but really evolution across the board. Okay. And then in, in 1980, you became involved in the fight to prevent the teaching of creationism in the public schools in Lexington, Kentucky. Can you tell us what brought you to that fight? Yes, I had been collecting um, the literature for, of the creation science movement since oh, uh, 10 years earlier and when I was in graduate school. And um, when I was uh, teaching anthropology as a professor at the University of Kentucky uh, in 1980, the uh, Citizens for Balanced Teaching of Origins, as they called themselves, came to the Lexington um, Board of Education, the public school board, and uh, suggested that this great new science of creation science be taught. And of course, those of us in the science faculty up on campus you know, just reacted with, with horror. So did the uh, teachers in the community. They didn't want to teach this nonsense as science. And um, interestingly enough, so did the, um, uh, the mainstream clergy in town. They also did not want to have what essentially was a biblical literalist theology presented as science Monday through Friday and then have to straighten the kids out on the weekend mm -hmm. because that wasn't their theology. So the scientists, the teachers, and the clergy all banded together to try to keep creation science out of the Lexington uh, curriculum. And uh, we won. And, and it's basically that same formula, so to speak, of, of organizing people at the grassroots who represent different constituencies to try to keep good science in the classroom and uh, religious views, you know, masquerading as science really out of them that uh, we still use at the National Center for Science Education today. Could you tell us about uh, your role in the famous Dover case? Ah, yes, that was a very interesting case. Uh, Dover, Pennsylvania School Board um, had been on our radar for a long time. We'd received calls from citizens there over the years about you know, the school board trying to bring creationism in in some fashion or another. And finally, in uh, 2004, they did it. They passed a policy requiring that teachers had to teach uh, intelligent design. And um, so um, th this came after a period of over a year of citizens there trying very hard to um, make the school board change its mind, moderate its policies, and uh, just not do this. Teachers also were very active in trying to persuade the board to not do this. But finally, there was, there was nothing left to do except sue. So uh, NCSE ended up as the um, advisor to the legal team on issues of creation science, on the science of evolution, on the history of the creationist movement, um, and it was a really strong partnership. They, they, were, they were incredible lawyers to work with. Could you, you know, briefly describe the judge's findings about intelligent design and relationship to creationism? What was so powerful about the decision in Kitzmiller versus Stover was that it was a full trial, and the intelligent design people had their best shot at presenting a coherent and cogent explanation for why intelligent design was valid science and why it was pedagogically uh, important to teach it. And uh, we, of course, had the burden of showing that, no, intelligent design wasn't science. The only reason for teaching it was to promote a sectarian religious view. And the fact that it wasn't science meant that there was no valid pedagogical reason for teaching it. You can pull the wool over the, over the public's eyes if uh, they're only hearing one side of it. And if you're good at the merchandising and, and the framing of your arguments, it doesn't work quite so well in a court of law. And at the end of the, um, uh, the trial, after the dust had settled, this 
Republican judge who is a churchgoer who was appointed by George W. Bush who did not have a big science background at all. He basically, he has, he has said when requested to speak on this uh, subject uh, after the trial, that he just had a general liberal arts education. Um, he went into law. He didn't go into science. Um, but he was able to see that there was no there there, that the, um, what the intelligent design people presented as valid science was, by their own admission, not considered valid science. Um, what the intelligent design people presented as appropriate philosophy of science, the method of science, how do you conduct science, was by their own admission, not valid. So it was actually um, not a difficult decision for the judge to, to make. And uh, I would encourage anybody uh, who is interested in either the nature of science, how do science, scientists come up with their uh, conclusions, or with this particular controversy about creationism and evolution, to read the judge's decision. Well, thanks very much for speaking with us today, Dr. Scott. It's my pleasure. It's always um, delightful to be a guest of Scientific American. Thank you. I'm Eugenie Scott at the National Center for Science Education. There are really good science books that you can find at scientificamericanbookclub.com. Check them out.